And I love the French toast made with gluten-free bread. I'm in a diner around 20 miles west of the city of Rochester in New York State. You want any bacon or sausage or anything? Um, I'm sitting in a booth with Kay Walter and Marsha Curry, who went to high school with Joseph Maloney's wife, June, the woman you heard about at the end of episode one, the woman Joseph Maloney allegedly murdered. What does she look like? She had like reddish hair, dark, kind of dark red hair, and uh, she was th freckles, freckles and thin. Mm -hmm. A nice, nice person. Kay was in June's year in high school, Marcia was in the year behind. The class of 59, we're kind of a, a group of us. A lot of people moved away because there's not a lot of uh, opportunities here. In this episode, we're going to get to know June and Joe to understand what was going on in their relationship, right up to when June was poisoned at the age of 26. From RTE Documentary on One, this is Runaway Joe. I'm Pavel Barter. Episode two, June and Joe. June Maloney was born June Rosalie Fisk in 1940 in a rural farming community west of Rochester, New York. As World War II raged across Europe, America was just coming out of the Great Depression. Rural America was still living in a world of black and white. June's father, Ward, worked as a laborer on apple and cherry orchards. His wife, Marie, worked in the nursing home next door to where they lived. Like many families in America at the time, the family struggled, lived frugally, worked hard, and survived, mainly to help the next generation, like June and her younger brother, have better lives. June's classmate, Kay Walter, lived close to June. I always remember her being very thin, the red hair and the freckles, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that the family had a lot of money. The fact that her father was a tenant farmer, he walked to work every morning. You could set your clock by him. He'd go up the street and then, you know, come home at night. June's family could not afford to own a car. So Kay's father used to drive June to school every day. Every day, school day, from the fall of 57 through 59, I rode to school with her or she rode with me. I would say she was quiet. Uh, I mean, I don't mean we didn't speak on the way to school. I mean, it was just very kind of small talk, get to school, okay, see you tomorrow morning, that type of thing. And then she was involved in cheerleading. According to their high school yearbook of 1959, June, as well as being a cheerleader, was active in the National Honor Society and the Glee Club. I was in the Glee Club for a couple years, what yes. What was the Glee Club? Oh, so sing chorus. A chorus. Singing, yeah. What kind of songs would you sing? Oh, uh, of, well. it, Inchworm. <laughs> we, we sang Inchworm. <laughs> I don't remember really what we sang. I know I was a second alto at that time. <laughs> I, I, just, I remember that June might have been a soprano and on the other side because I don't remember my association with her. At this stage in her life, June was planning her future. She wanted to be a nurse. So she joined the Future Nurses Club in her high school. As part of that, June made visits to local clinics and hospitals where she learned about health care. Those who knew her described her as shy, but hugely caring and compassionate. And from her teenage years, she had mapped out the life ahead of her. But all that would change when she met Joseph Maloney. Years before Joseph Maloney was born, his parents left their native Ireland, counties Leash and Offaly, and travelled in search of a new life. Joseph, their first son, was born in the city of Rochester, New York, in 1935, which would make him 88 years old today. When you look back at Joseph Maloney growing up on the streets of Rochester, Maybe there were warning signs that he would one day find his way onto the FBI's most wanted list. I've come to meet one of Joe Maloney's childhood friends. Neil Grover Dunkelberg. 
I met him when I was about nine years old. Uh, he lived on Linden Street in Rochester, uh, three or four blocks away from where I lived. What sort of area was that of Rochester? Um, it was house after house. You know, there's not anything particularly uh, fancy about it. He lived in uh, a double house. Uh, they rented out the top floor and lived on the bottom floor. Joe Maloney's parents were a happy, loving couple. Locals remember them walking along Linden Street, arm in arm, to attend Mass on Sundays. And they worked hard in order to send their son Joseph to a private school. And they were Irish. Oh my, were they? <laughs> Yes, I, I used to make fun of the Irish, uh, just to upset Joe. <laughs> you get, oh, oh, come on now. And it was fun time. His mother was a very pleasant woman. She always treated me nicely, fed me occasionally. And of course, my mother fed Joe occasionally too. Although Joe only had one brother there and my mother had uh, three kids that she was taking care of. Joe was expelled from the private Catholic school, and so he ended up attending the local public school with his best friend, Neil. Joe only had one other sibling, a younger brother named James. He was a little more reserved uh, personality. He was, wasn't as goofy as Joe. He didn't hop and skip and holler and yell as much as Joe did. <laughs> Joe's father worked as a night watchman in a psychiatric facility, Rochester State Hospital. Years later, his father's job would help Joe escape justice in the most unlikely of circumstances. His father worked at night, so he slept during the day, and it was interesting visiting during the day. You had to be quiet because Dad was sleeping. Joe Maloney was born with a shock of red hair. He grew tall and was very bright. He liked to go places, like to do things, look for adventure all the time. Uh, he was uh, annoyed some people pretty well, and getting fights now and again. <laughs> he assisted me in um, making uh, little places up in Highland Park in the woods. Uh, we dug a cave once in the side of the hill, dug in about, uh, oh, about 20, 25 feet uh, uh, the soil we dug out was washing downhill into this gentleman's backyard, and <laughs> we felt that we'd better stop when he screamed at us one day and was calling the police. Uh, youthful nonsense. He'd get in fights uh, here and there around, you know, with the other kids in the neighborhood, but uh, I never, I never knew him to go wild with rage and that sort of thing. Did he have a nickname? There were some that called him Crazy Joe. I believe I was one of them once in a while. <laughs> um, he had some little peculiarities that would get other kids going, you know. He'd holler and yell and, and say nasty things occasionally. <laughs> Joe was a bit of a tear away as a kid. But then he started to become something else, a compulsive liar. He would fantasize for hours about having an older brother, and he harbored an obsession with the military that would last his whole life. Joe was uh, superb at lying. Joe would lie about everything, every day. Um, he just had a wonderful imagination, and it came out in these lies. He just seemed to have been born with a knack for <laughs> coming out with a story. And stories he did. But you, you were wise to him by the sounds of things. I was wise to him. Uh, years of uh, knowing him and uh, watching what he's does and talking to other people about him. Yes, I, I knew what he was doing. Joe Maloney made his way through his teenage years without coming to the attention of the police. He graduated from high school at the age of 18 in 1953, together with his best friend, Neil. By this stage, Joe had grown to six foot three inches in height 
and he was stuck in a rut. His buddy Neil had joined the US Air Force and was stationed in the United Kingdom, whereas Joe failed the psychological evaluation tests for the US Army and had to settle for a six-month stint in the local National Guard at home in Rochester. Neil only wrote to him once when he was away in the UK. I think I wrote him one note. He had said something to my sister and she uh, wrote me a letter saying that he'd said some nasty things to her. So I wrote him a note back saying, hey, behave yourself, boy. <laughs> Joe drifted from one job to another, but throughout this time, he continued to help his father at his job in Rochester State Hospital. Maybe he had a premonition of what would come in later years. Joseph Maloney was bored in Rochester. Late one night, he reactivated a decommissioned Civil War cannon and woke up half the city. On another occasion, in 1955, he was arrested walking down the street with a Thompson submachine gun. He was taking it home, he told officers, to figure out how it worked. When his buddy Neil got back from England, he and Joe teamed up again in Rochester. They were now in their early 20s. The two of us got an apartment. It was an interesting stay. <laughs> it was a nice little apartment on Westminster Road. We had ladies visit occasionally. Joe was uh, working for a construction company and uh, he had gotten into uh, some of the instruments, some of the digging tools that they used in construction companies. And he was interested in explosives. So um, I taught him a little bit about explosives. He got good with explosives all by himself. He was using dynamite. One thing that hadn't changed since Neil first became friends with Joe was his compulsive lying. By now, Joe's fantasies were beginning to spiral out of control, according to one of his former girlfriends. He took me to his house and introduced me to his mother. But then he was showing me all these diplomas that he had on his bedroom wall. And apparently, they were all fictitious. He was a liar, a downright liar. Although Joe was born in America, his parents never lost their connection to Ireland. As a child, Joe traveled to Ireland many times to see his relations and he could put on a pretty convincing Irish accent, Neil Dunkelberg remembers. He could put on an Irish accent and I'd put on a German accent and we'd yell at each other occasionally. In his early 20s, Joe used this adopted Irish accent to talk his way into medical school. He convinced officials at the University of Rochester that he was a medical student from Dublin who had come to the United States to care for his ailing mother and he wanted to continue his studies. I had been a student there and um, I took him up and showed him around the library at one point. Joe grilled Neil Dunkelberg for information about the university and its campus. This was an early sign of how meticulous Joe could be in his deceptions. He was, he was an excellent uh, bullshitter, if you will. He could talk. Oh, could he talk? <laughs> he had the gift of the gab. At the University of Rochester, Joe took classes in anatomy and biochemistry while his background check was pending. He certainly was out of his depth, yes. Uh... There was an aura of mystery about him even then. It's hard to know what's true about him. These are the words of Joseph Picciotti, Maloney's laboratory partner in chemistry classes at the University of Rochester. I don't know anybody who really knows Joe. I don't know if that person exists. He was more than a chameleon. He was a man of many faces. When the background check returned from Ireland, debunking his story, Joe Maloney was kicked out of medical school. But before he discarded his disguise, he took something, or rather someone, with him. 
June Fisk's family may have been poor, but like her parents, she was a hard worker. After she graduated from high school, she was awarded a scholarship to the nursing school of Genesee Hospital in Rochester. June had found her vocation, and Joe Maloney had found her. He was hanging around the nurse's residence hall, dressed up as a doctor. A friend recalled, There was a big living room with a fireplace and a piano, and it was on the first floor. No men were allowed above the first floor, but he was sitting there one day in a lab coat, as if he was a doctor. He had a stethoscope. Even though June quickly figured out that Joe was no doctor, she liked him and began dating him. But by then, it was already too late for June Fisk. When you think of Joe, he was a nice-looking, very outgoing, personable guy. June's childhood friend, Marsha Curry, was a student nurse with June at Genesee Hospital. When he would come to the dorm to pick June up, everybody knew him, and he knew most of the students, so he was that kind of a person. You know, and you can probably see how she fell for him. He was handsome. He was nice-looking and very outgoing, very personable. June had fallen in love with Joe. When she was 21 and he was 26, they married, and their first baby, Joey, was born a year later in 1962. June graduated from nursing school and quickly became a head nurse. They moved into a house in an upmarket area of Rochester. From the outside looking in, life looked great. But things weren't great. The thing I remember is that Every night, just about, June would have just a tale of woe about Joe and things he was doing, uh, things he was doing to her and the family. Uh, a lot it's of from this point in our series that we begin to hear about the power, the manipulation, the intimidation and the control that Joe Maloney began to exert over his wife, June. Coercive control. So take good care from here on in. Joe was a womanizer and a financial disaster, owing money all around him. When his mother died in 1962, he splashed his inheritance on a new Ford Mustang. June's friend Marsha can still remember how it upset June. A lot of financial problems. He would steal money and he would spend money on things they didn't have. Now, as far as him having other women and that sort of thing, I don't remember. <coughs> because mainly it was, um, the finances were a big thing with her, the, the, that he was very irresponsible and made her life miserable. He used to um, play tricks on her. He would tell her things and they weren't true and try to make her believe things. He was that kind of a character. Another of June's friends also noticed some creepy things about him. He was strange, an odd person. He talked about death a lot and drove a decommissioned ambulance. He must have bought it at an auction, as far as I can remember, and cleaned it all up and called it his meat wagon. Back to Neil Dunkelberg, Joe's best friend. Neil took a psychology class at the University of Rochester and that began to change his view on Joe. I would call him a walking case study in, in a way. Actually, my psychology classes uh, did fill me in on the kind of person that Joe was, uh, psychiatric peculiarities, uh, an oddity. Yes, I think a sociopath is a good description, uh, a, a psychopath in some ways. But uh, it didn't come out. He, it didn't come out readily. Uh, you had to know him a while, a bit. You'd get to know him and find out some of the things he engaged in before you recognized him as uh, a bit of a weirdo. Neil was inspired to write a paper about Joe's psychiatric peculiarities for his class. Did you tell Joe that you'd written this about him? Yes, as a matter of fact, I think I showed him the paper that I wrote about him. I didn't use his name. 
but I was wrote a paper for the class, Abnormal Psych, and uh, he was very interested in it. He wasn't mad? No, no, he thought it was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> he liked the attention? Yes, he always loved the attention. During the early years of their marriage, June tried to escape Joe, moving out of the family home several times, but Joe kept hounding her to come back. By 1965, they'd been married for four years. June was 25 years old now, and Joe was 30, and that same year, their second child, a daughter named Patricia, or Patty Ann, was born. Things really went bananas. I mean, Joe was... Joe was working in construction. He uh, was working with explosives most of the time. He loved explosives. And uh, she uh, tried to stay away from him as much as possible. She had gotten to the point where she was nervous about associating with him. He was, at times, he threatened her. When they started breaking up, I, I tried to I tried to back her up and, and keep her from being injured by Joe because he was threatening her. I was helping her get away from him. Physically threatening her? Physically threatening her, yes. And uh, she, was, she was pretty upset at the, the, that part of their breakup. She really wanted to escape. Joe became increasingly manipulative, even injuring himself in order to garner sympathy from June. I think he was playing a game. He played a lot of those, and uh, stabbing himself with a screwdriver sounds just like something he'd do to uh, uh, get the attention, get the comfort from the surrounding folks, especially his wife. I, I know she was very frustrated with her life. Marsha Curry, who was working alongside June as a nurse, says that Joe... Just wasn't a very nice person. I, and I remember always thinking, I, I probably didn't say it to her, but, you know, why doesn't she leave him? Why yeah. doesn't she get rid of him? Yeah. And I guess she finally did. In March 1967, shortly after one of Joe's routine visits back to Ireland to meet his relatives, June made her final move out of their family home and into a two-bedroom apartment in Rochester. Well, this is, this is the only photograph. I had other photographs. I'm in a house with a woman who was June's neighbour and close friend. This is a picture of Patty Ann playing out in the dirt. <laughs> and this is Joey. My name is Wanda Brooks. I'm in Rochester, New York. I got married in March of 1967, and my husband and I moved into the apartments at 100B La Chase Drive. And we were there all by ourselves at first. And then this young lady moved in with two children, and we started talking and just became friends. More like an older sister and an you know, old sister type thing. She was just a really nice lady. And she, oh, she adored her kids. Wanda and June lived opposite each other. June's kids, Joey and Patty Ann, would wander back and forth between the apartments. And June had met someone new. Yes. Lee Clemente. She was happy. She seemed happy. Yeah. But Joe Maloney, he wasn't happy. When he heard that June had a boyfriend, he became enraged, according to Neil Dunkelberg. She had another guy that was looking after her because she feared Joe. Rochester Democrat and Chronicle. Violence erupted March 11, 1967, when Maloney was charged with trying to stab his wife. The complaint was withdrawn two days later, said the Monroe County District Attorney. According to the reports, Joe slashed through the convertible top of June's car, barely missing the young mother. A similar complaint charging Maloney with assaulting her boyfriend was also dropped on March 13th, according to police records. Neil continued to challenge his friend Joe about his behaviour. At times he, 
he listened and said, well, maybe you're right. And, and a couple of times he got annoyed with me and said, well, you know, you're getting too pushy. Uh, I'm living my own life, blah, blah, blah. I know at one point during the time, um, June must have called the police and they came. But they went to the wrong apartment building. They went to the apartment building across next door. Instead of checking where the call came from, they just left. So then I guess everything settled down and he left. Why did she call the police? Well, I think they were having issues. He wouldn't leave or whatever the case may be. Wanda, June's neighbour, she never trusted Joe. It's, I would have to say, I, he kind of scared me a little bit. I don't think he's anybody to be pushed. I remember being a big man and being, you know, he give you a scary, eerie feeling, you know. A few weeks later, after June moved into her own apartment, Joe Maloney made a visit to the home of his friend, Neil Dunkelberg, who by now was working for a pharmaceutical company. Neil was a hobby scientist, and he kept some chemicals in his basement, some of which were poisonous. It was uh, a table with a bunch of chemicals on shelves around it, and um, the various tubes and uh, my Bunsen burner. Neil remembers that Joe came looking for just one thing. Methyl alcohol. Colorless? Well, yes, it uh, looks like water. Odorless? No, it's not odorless. Methyl, ethyl, butyl, all the alcohols have a, a scent. Poisonous? Um, methyl alcohol is poisonous. He wanted something that uh, would keep the dog from messing around in his trash, in his garbage can. The dog tipped it over once, and it was made kind of a mess in his yard. He wanted to poison that dog. I gave him something that smelled nasty to keep the dog away. I didn't give him any poison. I always wondered what he was likely to do with poison. A few days later, Joe came back when Neil was out. I think he told my sister that uh, he'd had, a, had problems with rats or mice or something and he wanted to poison them. Neil's sister Gail gave Joe a jar of methyl alcohol. May 27th, 1967. Joe and June Maloney had agreed to celebrate their son Joey's fifth birthday together at Joe's home. June and her neighbour Wanda went to a shop to buy a birthday cake for Joey. Then June dropped Wanda back home with her 18-month-old daughter, Patty Ann. Everything was fine and Patty Ann took a nap and all that. And then I got a phone call later in the afternoon and she said, Wanda, why don't you come over with Patty Ann and come to the party? And I said, well, I said, no, no, I don't want to go. So... I said, no, you go ahead and have a good time, and I'll put Patty to bed and that, and everything, you know, we'll work everything out. June had invited some family and friends to her son Joey's fifth birthday party, including her mother and father, and her brother, Dale, who has since died. But we have Dale's account of what happened next from his statement to police. June arrived in her own car about 4, 4.15. Shortly after that, she had the same as us. Vodka and orange served in an ordinary water glass in a pattern of blue and brown design. We just sat and talked. Joe started a charcoal fire outside and put the steaks on. We all had dinner. Joe mixed June's drink, but in the kitchen, while she was actually sitting in the kitchen, I didn't actually see him mix the drinks. Then June and Joe had a small argument after dinner about the car. She went upstairs, and he went up a little while later. June complained about being tired and drowsy, like she'd had too much to drink. June also had a Manhattan, just one taste. She mentioned the Manhattan was awfully strong, and she didn't want the rest. She left around 6 p.m. with her son. 
When June returned to her apartment with Joey that evening, her neighbour Wanda says that June was not feeling well. And she walked in the door, and it was like she was a different person. June, I said, how many drinks did you have? She says, Wanda, I only had two. Two drinks? I said, you're acting kind of funny. I know, she says. I don't know what's wrong. Dale, June's brother, was so concerned by June's earlier behavior at the party that he drove to June's apartment to see how she was. According to his police statement, when he arrived, Joe was already there. I arrived at her house around 6.15. Joe Maloney seemed concerned. He'd been drinking, but he appeared sober. I stayed at her apartment for about half an hour. She was normal and felt a little better. I went back to Joe Maloney's and stayed there until 1 a.m. Wanda, the babysitter, was in June's apartment. Wanda remembers June telling Joe to leave. She was going to go and lay down, go to bed. And he didn't want her to. He wanted to stay there. And she said, no, you leave. So he finally left and we parted ways and she went next door and I went to my place and that was that. The coming days would set in train a course of events which would change the lives of many people who had been at Joey's fifth birthday party, as well as the lives of some who hadn't. As this is a live investigation, if you have any knowledge, no matter how small, of Joseph Maloney, a.k.a. Michael O'Shea, or of his next wife, Sheila O'Shea, maiden name Chandler, please contact us immediately via documentaries at rte.ie. Join us for more in Episode 3, Manhunt. Runaway Joe is written and produced by me, Pavel Barter, and Tim Desmond. Researched by Nicolene Greer. Music is by Martin Kluzak. The sound engineer is Pater Carney. And the executive producer for RTE Documentary on One is Liam O'Brien. If you've been affected by any of the themes in this episode, please reach out to rte.ie forward slash helplines, where you'll find contacts for a variety of support networks around abuse and domestic violence.